just curious about learning a bit more about some of the other um, herbs and medicines that they use because I, I think um, San Pedro's used a lot over here for clearing, for smudging. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so just, you know, just interested in, in cool. that kind of stuff. Yep, yeah, I'll talk a lot about San Pedro as well. Thank you for that. Tom. Hi. Yeah, so um, I, I live in Scotland and uh, I'm moving out to the Amazon, uh, not next year, but the year after that to work with a doctor um, who will be doing these sort of ceremonies with people. So actually I'm, I'm a novice completely and I just like to learn everything there is to know. That's why I've woken up uh, especially early to, to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Tom. What well, time is it in Scotland right now? Uh, it's, it's the, um, it's, it's, what time is it now? Uh, 8.41. Oh, okay, thank you. I've actually got a Scottish background. My grandfather was Scottish. He used to, he used to, play, me the, he used to play me the bagpipes when I was a kid. Right, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Angela, what's the main thing you'd like to learn tonight? Uh, how the medicines can heal oh, wow. and what they heal. And, yeah. Cool, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, Tatiana. Hi everyone. Um, today I'm delighted to join tonight. I, I am from Colombia and um, I live in Adelaide and tonight I wanted to join to hear about your experience on mainly ayahuasca. I myself have been in ceremonies in the south of Colombia and yeah, it's, um, very, it's a very powerful plant and um, I would like to hear your experience on that, basically. Thanks, Tatiana. I've actually been to Colombia many times. Oh, wonderful. And the south of Colombia is the first place I drank, is the first place I actually um, drank ayahuasca. Oh, beautiful. In Putumayo? Uh, no, it was another place. I can't quite remember it, but. Oh, okay, in the Amazon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah right down, down yeah. south, but um, very, very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. No, uh, Lisa, welcome. What would you like to learn tonight? Um, hello there. Um, hi, yes, I'm from the UK. Um, I've taken ayahuasca a lot myself and I've had an um, incredible healing journey with ayahuasca. Uh, so um, in my own life, I also now work with the plant. I'm also a Cambo practitioner. So I have a lot of experience in ceremony. And uh, so, yeah, I'm really here to heal and help people heal, to share my story. And I'm always open to learn from others. Cool. Thank you. So that will get you to share a lot of your stuff. So if people don't know what Cambo is, it's actually frog medicine, right, where you put um, – it's really, really powerful, but it's actually extre – it can be extremely um, challenging experience. Not for a long time, but – um, you feel like you're going to die, then you actually want to die. Um, but it's actually extremely powerful for your immune system. And we'll come talk a little bit about that. It's very common. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the locals used to, drink, used to take Cambo, the frog medicine they put under their skin, um, before they go and hunt because it protects you. We'll come and talk about that. Peter. Hi there. I uh, currently use a lot of Chinese or... Um, Indian type plants, and some cool. of them are well known, like holy basil, ashwagandha, harataki, etc. Cool. I I like my dowsing, so I usually can tell tell either by holding the the uh, substance or just yep. dowsing with a pendulum if I need it or not. So that's a bit of my background. Cool. Thank you for that. Where do you live, Peter? Um, Glen Waverley in Victoria. Okay. So not cool. Too far away. Yeah, I'm from St Kilda. I'm St Kilda. Okay. Hello, Mark. Mark Hello. Lucas, we're mm -hmm. just getting people to share what, what they want to learn tonight. So what's the main thing you want to learn tonight, Mark? Sorry, say that again? Can you hear me? Yes, what's the main thing you want to learn tonight? We can hear you. Uh, look, I, I'm just curious. I, uh, If you don't mind, a bit of an interloper. I'm just looking for someone to talk to tonight or to listen to. And uh, I like the sound of the group, so I figured I might learn something. I have uh, no specific intention to learn any specific thing. I'm just curious. Is that okay? Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Uh, welcome to the night. Uh, Linda. Hello, Linda. Hi, how are you? Good. What, what would you like to learn tonight? Uh, yeah, because I, I have uh, started to learn some uh, amaro therapy and also for spirituality um, practice and meditation. And, yeah, I have been learning um, many years, like 10 years. 
Cool. So from and uh, the healing from the plants, I think, yeah, um, I I can relate to that. So cool. um, it's the gift from the nature. I think it's um, plants has their own spirit. So yeah, cool. it's uh, something already has been connection through the essential oils and then for the amount therapy. Yeah, so I want to go further. Yeah. Cool, thank you for that. Okay, is there anybody else that wants to say anything? Okay. Okay, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about what is healing, because I'm actually a healing pr practitioner. I do actually, I'm, I'm an energetic shaman. I work with energy. I don't specifically work with plants. And when I was there, actually, I still work with energy. All right, so I actually teach a lot of shamanic healing in Australia. That's what I do. I train healers to become shamanic. So the way I'm looking at healing and the way I'm going to explain to you is, is the way shamans look at healing. And it's totally different to Western medicine. And it was really exciting that when I went to South America, a bit like Janine, I was sort of drawn, drawn there. And, you know, I had a dream when I was seven years old that I was going to go and live in the Amazon jungle. And I went and told mum. I said, mum, where's, where's the Amazon jungle? And she thought it was in Brazil, so I thought I was going to live in Brazil. But I actually spent a lot of time in Colombia and, and Peru. And, and, and probably the, the ayahuasca centre of the world is a place called Iquitos, which is in the top part of uh, Peru, quite close to the Colombian border. It's quite interesting. There's a famous book called The Salisone Prophecy. I don't know if anyone's read that. But that actually book was actually, he, he actually talks about Iquitos, which is quite interesting in that book. There's a lot of ayahuasca centres out from Iquitos. Yeah, and Kedos is a very interesting place because it's the largest city in the world you can't access by road. You can only get there by boat or by plane. So most of the local people, they've never left there. So it's sort of got its own energy. It's a really interesting place. But I'm going to come and talk at the end too about, um, give you some ideas that if you want to go and take ayahuasca, obviously when, when uh, the travel restrictions um, open up, um, what to look for when you go to an ayahuasca centre. Because that's, that's really important. Yeah. So let's talk about healing. So to explain healing, I'm going to really explain to you first um, our concept of what happens when we come to the planet. Because you've got to really understand how you exist here to understand illness and healing. And this is the way shamans look at it. So as a soul, we come into the body to use our body to actually um, manifest in the earth dimension. So to me, it's a bit like a pipeline. You know, it's like a flow of energy that comes through our body so that we can use our hand, use our mind, use our emotions to actually create. Now, if we let our soul, our soul essence, which is, our, which is what our unique um, essence of why we came to the planet. So if we allow our unique, what I call our soul essence, our spirit to come through, there's going to be a very open pipeline as we a lot of flow of energy and you're going to be feel in a high state of vibration. Now, if you block who you are, block your soul, and we'll come talk in a minute, why would people do that? If you block your soul, which most people do, fit into this crazy world, that's why the world's going through a major change right now, is if you block your soul, what you do is you're blocking the flow of energy into your body and your body has less energy and therefore it develops symptoms and when you develop symptoms the symptom is really to tell you that that you're blocking your soul and we call that illness now the main reason why people block their soul is because they they have trauma where they hold limiting thoughts like i can't i won't if i open my heart i'll be hurt uh, i can't express myself if we've got limiting thoughts that blocks the energy flow, blocks the pipeline, blocks your soul coming into your body. Shams call it soul loss. I don't, I don't know if soul loss is a, is a total correct term because to me it's, you're not embodying your soul. And most people are not in their bodies. And I know that from doing a lot of body work. Most people can't feel their bodies. Most people are in their heads in, the West, in Western life. Um, Tay Down will probably tell you in, in, in Colombia and South America, people are more in their hearts and they feel more. Yeah, I can totally. Yeah, is that right, Tatiana? Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I can totally feel when I meet people in Melbourne. I can totally feel if they're from South America or not, because their energy is totally different. 
Maken ze maar open. So, it's all illness, and I'm talking all illness, is caused by blocking your soul, it's called, which is caused by limited thoughts that you have at a time of trauma. Usually most of our trauma is when we're a child. Now, therefore, healing is re re reconnecting to your soul. In other words, what shamans tend to call is they call it soul retrieval. And what it means is that you're letting go of those limiting thoughts, limiting beliefs, so that you're allowing the pipeline of energy to flow through you. Now, there's more of your soul is in your body so that you can manifest in the planet. So to me, healing is embodying more of your soul. And this is really important because what a lot of people say is healing is about being spiritual. And I said, no, it's not. I see, you know, people say, oh, we, and people go and drink ayahuasca and they say, I want to be more spiritual. And I said, you're going the wrong way. We are a spirit. What healing is, is being more earthly, is actually about bringing your soul into the body so that we can manifest in the earth dimension. So in a way, it's not about ascension, because as a soul, you don't need to ascend. You are infinite consciousness. So as a soul, you don't need to ascend. In a way, you need to descend. You need to come into the earth. Because, and I notice that, because when people heal, they're more present, they're more in their bodies. So for instance, when I'm training healers, one of the important things I do is I help them let go of any limiting beliefs they have about themselves being a healer. And a lot of, and quite often that is a low self-worth. I've I found that's one of the biggest blocks that people have. They've got a low self-worth, right? They don't value themselves. They're thinking, they're feeling they're inadequate. They don't feel they're good enough. And that probably comes from judgment when they're a child or a bit like me, you didn't fit into the world, right? Because what uh, when I was younger, I was quite magical. Like I used to build energetic pyramids and talk to the universe, right? But when I realised other people didn't do that, I first thought I was crazy. Right? And I felt like they're like Harry Potter, you know, living in a muggle's world. And in a way, that's why humanity is going through a major change right now because humans can't live in the way they've been living. It's, it's, it's affecting the planet too much and people are in very low consciousness. So in a way, when you're actually reconnecting to your soul, what you're doing is you're bringing more of your consciousness of your soul essence to the planet, the reason you came here. Some people call it your life purpose. So does that make sense? Any any questions on that? Put, put up your hand if you want any clarification. But it's quite exciting because when I went to the Amazon jungle, which is probably in about 2010 is the first time I, I went there, is I got really excited when I met the shamans because they've got a very similar concept of healing to what I just explained to you. So then the question is, well, how how can a plant help you heal? Well, the first thing is, a, if you're drinking ayahuasca, which is like a vine, a vine that grows in the jungle, right, and they cook it up as a tea, right, if you drink it, is how can a plant help you heal? Well, the first point is it's not a magic pill. You know, a lot of people in Western, in, in Western life, they want to take a prescription pill which they believe is going to make them heal. And I can tell no pills make you heal. Because there's only one thing that can heal you, and that's yourself, by letting go of your limiting beliefs. Right? If anybody tells you they heal you, walk away from them because they're lying to you. I've never healed anyone. What I do is I help people heal themselves. So a really important thing about healing and being ready to heal, which is an important question, you know, because I'm sure some of you are asking the question, are you ready to drink ayahuasca? Well, probably if you're here tonight, you've certainly got a calling, right? Even if you're not aware of it, or as Janine said, even if you not know why you, well, why you got a calling, but you don't really need to know why, because your intuition might just tell you. Right, so what does the plant do for you then? What the plants do is they open you up you open up your visual centers so that you look at your life and you look at your blocks and therefore they're very empowering. So for instance, when you drink ayahuasca, which is an extremely powerful medicine, right? I mean, I, don't, I haven't taken a lot of, um, of other um, uh, drugs, right? Like marijuana or whatever. 
But I, from talking to people who've taken those plants, ayahuasca is 100 times stronger. So what ayahuasca does is it opens up your visual centres so that you can see your limiting blocks, see your limited beliefs. And therefore it's very empowering because it helps you see what you need to let go of, your limited beliefs about life, about yourself, so you can heal. And therefore, taking um, ayahuasca can be very challenging. It's not, it doesn't necessarily is a pleasant experience because if you've got a lot of limiting thoughts about your life from when you were younger, those are going to come up. Now, when shamans see you drinking the medicine and see that you're going through a healing process, they get excited and they don't rescue you. They know that you're bringing stuff up to heal and to resolve, right? And, of course, once you drink the medicine, you can't go off of it. Oops, can I go off of it right now? No, you can't, right? And it can be really challenging. Like, And, you know, ayahuasca is going to bring up for you what you need, not what your ego thinks that you need to heal. Because quite often, you know, you go with the intention, oh, I want to heal this, but really the medicine will, will bring up what's necessary. And trusting the process is really important, really, really important. It's like, you know, the biggest thing that shamans said, and I talked to a lot of different shamans, they said that the biggest thing you need to do to drink the medicine, which is like for any healing really, is to surrender, which means let go of control, which I can tell for most Western people freaks them out because most people are control freaks. And that's why they're creating in the external world being controlled, right? Because, as you know, the law of attraction, what you bring into your life is a reflection of your inner energies. So in a way, a lot of the restrictions and lockdowns are just a reflection of what people do to themselves every day. But I'll give an example. Like, I remember this uh, girl, she was about 19. Now, when she drank the medicine, it usually takes about 20 minutes to come on to drink ayahuasca. Now, what it brought up for her was a really dramatic experience when she was a teenager. Her parents put her in a cult and there was a lot of abuse. She got sexually abused by the leader of the, of the cult and stuff. Now, when she started to drink the medicine, that actually brought, brought that up for her and she was having thoughts like, oh, my God, am I in another cult? How can I trust the shaman? Is he going to rape me? Right, all these thoughts came up, and she started screaming and said, "Get me all this medicine." So it was extremely challenging for her. But the exciting news is, she went through it, and she healed that experience because she hadn't healed that trauma. Now, a big fear that a lot of people have about drinking ayahuasca is because it takes you into different realms of consciousness. And for a lot of people, they don't access that consciousness in their normal life. I do anyway, because I'm a visionary person and I connect to multi-dimensions, right? But for people who aren't used to that, it takes you into different realms of consciousness. And for some people, that can be very exciting. You know, I've seen young guys drinking the medicine who don't have many blocks and they see the whole universe and God and a whole range of things is mind-blowing to them. But for some people who are not used to that, it can be a bit freaky. And that's why I certainly wouldn't suggest you drink ayahuasca by yourself. And for me in Australia, and even though you can drink it in Australia, even though it's illegal, but I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't drink ayahuasca in, in Australia, personally, is because you really need proper shamans. Because I can tell you the shamans there, they grow up on it. And they've got to go through a lot of training to become a shaman. Like they drink medicines for years and years and years. You know, they've got to do diet particular plants. And some of those diets, they've got to be in isolation for 30 days, 60 days, 150 days in isolation in the jungle. So a lot of people who know who run ceremonies in Australia, they're not real shamans, they're just facilitators. But the important role the shamans help you with they they sing during ceremony. They call them Icaros. Don't they, Italiana? You heard the word Icaros? Yes, Icaros. Icaros, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that's what they're doing is because the shamans drink the medicine as well, right? What they're doing is helping bring through the spirits of the plants. Because each each plant's got a spirit, got a consciousness. 
And what they do is through their songs, the Ikaro as they call them, they're bringing through the energy of the medicine. And I can tell you that when you're drinking it, your body is extremely sensitive. That's why you, you've got to drink ayahuasca at night. You can't drink it during the day. And it's, you've got to drink it in the dark. You can't have any lights on because you, you, it'll, it'll, take you out, it'll take you out of your internal journey. Because ayahuasca is an eternal journey. It's about getting you to look inside and reconnect to your soul. That's, what, that's the purpose of ayahuasca. Now, when you're listening to the music, it's like you feel the music. Not just hear it, you feel it. Like you feel it in every cell of your body. And you can be on your journey, you know, on your own internal journey. Because everyone goes on a different journey, right? Now, when you're on your own journey, you suddenly hear the shaman singing this song and it just helps you connect to a certain vibration to help you uh, connect to an energy which is going to help you heal. They're not healing you. They're helping you connect to your soul through the music. And sometimes they come out and they'll use little plants and they'll hit you with these little plant feathers, you know, right? And they're bringing you through certain vibrations to help you reconnect to your soul. Shams will tell you they don't heal you. They don't. But they're providing the space because they protect the space. That's another reason why you would why you would not drink ayahuasca alone. Because if you're not used to being in those different dimensions, you might not necessarily know how to handle the energy. It's a bit like if you've never been in a racing car before, it's a bit like it, it's a bit like would you jump in a racing car driving with people at 100 miles an hour, right? <laughs> when you've never driven a racing car before, probably not. Yeah, it's a bit like that. So that's why it's important because shamans, what they do is they protect the space. They enable, they, they protect the space around you and they they can help, you know, if you're in trouble, like you're going to something really deep and you need some help, they'll be there for you, to support you. But they don't rescue you, they allow you to go deep into your stuff. But I can tell you after sitting on 300 ceremonies, the biggest fear people have is they're not going to come back, they're not going to come down from ayahuasca. And I can tell you, I've never seen anyone not come down from it. You do come down. Now, if you're an empath, if you're extremely sensitive like me, ayahuasca for me used to last eight hours. For some people, the average is probably about four hours. But if you're extremely sensitive, it tends to last about eight hours. Now, if you're very sensitive, you've got to drink less medicine. Most people drink about probably 100 mils. And I can tell you it doesn't taste very nice. It tastes a bit like red wine that's off. That's, that's the best way I can explain it. But I, I actually don't drink red wine anyway, but that's probably what it tastes like. And as you drink more of it, the taste actually gets worse. And the reason is because you purge a lot on ayahuasca, you vomit because it clears out your body. And it's one of the Im impacts ayahuasca does. And you get very used to hearing people purge. And some people can purge for a couple of hours. You know, that's really cleansing your body. Because what ayahuasca does is it gets into your body and it cleanses it out. That's what it does. So ayahuasca and marijuana don't get on. So you can't really be taking marijuana and drinking ayahuasca. They're a bit like two brothers who fight. And marijuana doesn't increase your consciousness. You might go into high vibration for a while, but you can't hold it. With ayahuasca, once you've taken ayahuasca, it's in your system. And like I can, I can do my own ayahuasca ceremonies now without even taking ayahuasca because I can just connect to the vibration of it. Once it's in your system, then you can connect to the vibration of the medicine. So in terms of being ready to drink ayahuasca, what you really need to do is you really need to be ready to heal. And sometimes people, when they go and drink ayahuasca, they think they're ready to heal, but they're not because they don't surrender. And you can tell that because what they do is they drink the medicine and nothing happens. And as I said, most people drink 100 mils. If you're very sensitive, I drink a very small amount because if I drink 100 mils, it's a bit like driving a racing car around the corner 100 miles an hour. You can't control it. So if you're sensitive, you've got to drink less medicine, right? 
And that's another reason why you need a shaman because the shamans connect to you, they can feel your vibration and they'll t let you know how much is appropriate for you the first time. Drinking too much ayahuasca is very unpleasant and I know that for myself because when I drank too much, I couldn't control it. It was like, it was too intense for me. So to be ready to, 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 to drink the medicine and surrender is you got to allow the medicine to do what it wants to do. Now, what a lot of people do is they go there, but they're not ready to heal. They, they won't allow the medicine to work. And often some people drink three cups, because sometimes the shamans will ask you after half an hour or an hour, do you want some more medicine? And I've seen people drink three cups and nothing happen, because they're not ready. And I'll give a good ex example. When because the, the center I worked at in, in, in Akitas, we used to have a ceremony every two days, right? And this guy had been to three ceremonies and nothing happened. And I saw him the next morning because we used to do meetings in the mornings, right? And after ceremonies to help people. And he was crying. And you know, I saw him on the way to the shower and he's crying. He said, because all these people were having amazing experiences, right? But he had nothing had happened. And he was crying. And I said, he was actually from the UK, actually. And I said to him, you're not ready. And he said, yeah, no, I am. I said, no, you're not. I said, what you need to do is you need to go and sit in the jungle today by yourself and you need to really connect deeply to why you want to drink ayahuasca and why do you want to heal. And he did that. And the next ceremony, it was amazing. In the circle meeting the next day, the first thing he said is, I found my purpose. And I still remember and, and, and looking at him. And now he's a life coach around the world. And he's written his own book, which is exciting. He actually put me in it because he talked a bit about that story, right? And that was a bit about ayahuasca was working through me to kick his ass to say, look, no, you've got to open yourself up to hell. And that's why when you drink ayahuasca, you really need to be in a place where you get support. What I mean by that, the place that I worked, Phase three ceremonies of about between 10 to 15 people, no more. And we, used to have, we always used to have people that did not drink because people need support when they're drinking ayahuasca. Because quite often when you drink ayahuasca, you lose control of your body functions. Like sometimes you can't walk and sometimes you, you want to shit all the time, right? And you need help. And so we would always have people that would be available for people to support people, take them to the toilet, or you know, if they felt they're a bit out of control and then you needed someone to be there with them, right? But we also gave people support by having meetings the day after ceremonies, which would be the shaman and I'd be there because I could help them because I could feel their energies and see what's going on and would help people understand their journey. Because quite often if you go on a journey, you don't, a lot of people who, who haven't been into those different dimensions, they're quite confused about what they're experiencing. So it's really important to have the shaman or other healers there that can help you through your journey. Because like some places in Akitos, they like to do mass production where they do um, like 100 people in a ceremony and they don't give them any support the next day. And I'd run into people in the in Akitos who are totally confused and not understanding what they went through. So it's really important that if you go to a healing centre that you, you, you make sure that you're getting support before, during and after ceremony. That's really, really important. So Angela said it heals um, drug addictions. Yeah, so what is, what, what is um, ayahuasca really good for? It is really good for addictions, absolutely, right? It's really good for people with uh, depression, but actually it can be very challenging for people with depression because people with depression often have quite a lot of limiting beliefs and they come up. I remember one guy who came and he'd been depressed for 30 years. He said he hadn't, he hadn't experienced joy for over 30 years. Now the shaman wouldn't let him drink ayahuasca for a week. He gave him other plants first. Because he knew that if he drank ayahuasca, if he drank ayahuasca, it would have been too challenging for him, right? It would have brought up too much stuff, and then he would have resisted it. 
So he actually started healing, right, by just watching other people. Because he started telling jokes and everyone was laughing, liking his jokes, right? And he just enjoyed being around people who healed. Now, after his first ceremony, I saw him the next morning. Now, he was crying, but he was crying for a different reason. So I said to him, why are you crying? And he said, Paul, I felt joy last night for the first time for 30 years. Then I started crying. Just to see that guy with tears on his face, to know he had experienced joy was amazing. See, because he was ready, right? And that's why the shaman got him to um, prepare for a week. See, because shamans, they can connect to you and they know exactly what's going on for you. Because, you know, the next day after we're going and each people share what goes on in the, in the in their ceremony, the shamans connect you and they tell you to absolute detail what you went through. Because every ceremony <clears throat> is totally different for everybody. You might go through something amazing, someone's going through some really dark experience. You never know what the other person is going through. So... Yeah, but the shams will help you. They know exactly what you're going through and what you need to do. That's why you need to drink it with a proper shaman, not just a, not just a facilitator. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the, the some talk about OCD. Absolutely. Helps with that. In a way, ayahuasca helps with everything. I saw it help people heal almost everything, right, you can talk about physical disarments, people with fibromyalgia, people with cancer, you know, people with anything, emotional trauma, whatever, sexual abuse. I saw actually ayahuasca help heal people from anything if you're ready to heal. So how, do you, how does the ceremony run? So with ayahuasca, it's drunk at night because it's, it's, you're very extremely sensitive to light. So what they do is they usually drink it in an outside hut. But they make the medicine before. It takes about 24 hours to make the medicine. Right? They've got to cut up the vine and sometimes they mix it with other plants. And that's another reason why you've got to know what type of ayahuasca you're drinking because the strength of ayahuasca can differ as well. And you've got to make sure that if you're going overseas to drink ayahuasca, you want to make sure that it's strong medicine that it actually works. So, you know, they cook it up. It takes about 24 hours. You know, they've got to cut up the vine and, and cook it and they recook it and recook it. And so you're drinking it cold. So what you do is you go up to the table, the shaman calls you up, you drink it and you go down and sit on your mat. And once everyone drinks, the shaman then drinks. And then they blow out the candles, so you're in darkness, right? which can be scary for some people. But you drink, you, you're doing it with it's an internal journal anyway. But when the when the moon is out, it's absolutely amazing. Oh my god, because you're extremely sensitive to the light, and just feeling nature is amazing. Like we had thunderstorms when I was on ayahuasca, and like I felt that rain going through my body. It was so amazing because it's really sensitive. The medicine takes usually takes about uh, 20 minutes to, to have impact. Sometimes it's longer for people. Sometimes it really hits you like a whammy. And then it go, and that lasts about four hours. People start coming down after four hours. What I mean by coming down is they're sort of coming back more to the earth experience right? that, rather than being in their internal journey. Because when you're on, when you're going through your journey on ayahuasca, you're sort of just going into a different world of your own consciousness and your own existence. It's really, really powerful to do because it really gets you to look at yourself at a very deep level. So, you know, for me personally, I think someone asked this before is, ayahuasca helped me a lot with a lot of different things, issues I had and helped me connect to myself at a lot, at a lot deeper level. Well, I understand myself a lot more. So during, when, you, when you're taking ayahuasca, because everyone's on a different journey, you can't talk to people and you can't touch people. So, you know, for couples, I certainly wouldn't suggest you drink together because quite often if you're in the same room with your partner and they're going to do something, you'll tend to try and rescue them 
But the problem is that it's not your job to rescue them. The shaman's there to help them. So quite often with couples, it's not a good idea to drink together because it's an individual journey. And you've got to allow other people to go through what they're going through and not rescue them. So sometimes when couples came, we never let them sit, sit together in the room. They had to sit on the opposite sides of the room. Sometimes when people uh, are ta have taken ayahuasca, they go through something quite dramatic and they're quite noisy. And this can be, this can interfere with people, but you've got to learn how to hold your own space, right? Now, of course, as I said to you, when I was in the ceremonies, <coughs> we used to have um, people that didn't drink, quite often me, you know, like, and I used to help people that would be going through stuff because you want to make sure that people don't hurt themselves, you know? For instance, they try and get up and walk around and they're not really knowing where they are. But I'll give an example, like this guy, and I, I used to know when people would come, I could tell by the energy. And I said to the owner, when this guy came, he was very quiet, I said, watch out, this guy's got a lot of deep shit going on. Now, after he drank ayahuasca, he started screaming. He actually ran out of the room and he jumped into the lagoon, right, like a lake. And he stayed in the lake the whole night, but we had someone watching him, right? Now, he went through a lot of anger because he got abused by his mother. And all that came up for him. And he's really angry and he's screaming at his mother and said, how can you do this to me? Now, you can't really stop him going through that experience. You can't, because when people are going through it, they're not really aware of other people around them. They're in their stuff. Now, sometimes the people will do that inside of the healing room. Like that lady I told you about who um, got put into a cult when she was a teenager and got sexually abused, right? She started screaming. And you just got to allow yourself, if you're in that room going through a journey, you've got to really learn how to be in your own journey and not be affected by people. I mean, we try and help people to be quiet, but sometimes they can't be quiet because they're not even aware of they're making a noise because they're on their own journey, if that makes sense. And that's another reason why you don't want to drink in a room of 100 people. You can see I'm drinking with my cuppy with a monkey on it. My child monkey cup, right? Now, when you drink ayahuasca on the day, right, you can't have dinner. They usually do it straight after dark. You can't drink dinner because you've got to actually take it on an empty stomach. So you you have a, you have have tend to have a good lunch. You have a good rest. Right? And because it stimulates your senses a lot and it opens you up to different things and processing, it's a bit like going on a marathon. Because most people don't sleep much. If you sleep for two hours after drinking ayahuasca, you're really lucky. So some centers will tell you they'll do five ceremonies in seven days, which I can tell you to anyone is ridiculous. Because the place I did, they never did two ceremonies in, in two nights. Because you imagine like running a marathon and the next day you're getting up and doing it again. Because in a way, what we used to do is, right, you know, because you don't have dinner, you don't sleep, you're going through, you're processing a lot, right, using a lot of energy. And, you know, the next morning we'd go and help people explain what went on. Then for that day, most people would sleep and process. And then they would do it the following day. So I, I, ne I never drank ayahuasca two nights in a row and I wouldn't suggest anyone do it. I've only known one person to die from drinking ayahuasca, and that's because he drank ayahuasca 90 days in a row, which is ridiculous. He probably deserved to die. You know what I mean? You don't die from, you don't die from drinking ayahuasca. It's not dangerous. There's only one thing that, if, you, if you've got a heart problem, the shamans will allow you to drink ayahuasca. You can't drink ayahuasca if you've got a big heart problem. Because quite often what the shamans do is they use tobacco a lot. They'll blow tobacco over you. Tobacco is used as a plant, and I really got to honour tobacco when I was in South America because, you know, like I don't smoke, right? And, you know, in the West, people abuse tobacco as an addiction. As shamans, they use tobacco as a healing plant, and they blow it over you to help protect you and protect your energy. 
Now, sometimes what shamans will do, they actually put you on what's called a dieta, which is Spanish for diet. Now, what I mean by that is they get you to take a particular plant, which could be drinking it, and they might, they might get you to take different part of the plant. It could be the root, it could be the bark, it could be the leaves, and they get you to take it, and they get you not to be affected by other energies. So generally, you've got to be in isolation, and you don't eat much. Now, for most people, to be in isolation for seven days, they freak out. Like I remember a lady from New York, she, she told you, you've got to sit in your room and do nothing for seven days. No phone, nothing, right? She said, what, what? You know, being in New York, which is busy all the time, right? No, because you've got to connect to the plant. It's a bit, about, it's a bit like why well, a lot of people freak, freaked out about being in lockdown. I see shamans over there, they're used to it. They're used to being in isolation. And in a way, you're not in isolation because you're connecting to yourself and connecting to the plant. Now, one of the diets I did is I did a, I did a dieta on tobacco because shamans said it'd be good for you. So I did tobacco. Now, when I drank tobacco, it was, my God, so intoxic. It was like, because you've got to drink equivalent to six cigarettes. And I felt like a good drink going down my chest. I felt like this burning sensation. And I thought, oh, my shit. But it was the most amazing plant. Oh, my God. That evening, I did not sleep. It was like being in bed with a beautiful woman, right? You wouldn't sleep. And I just kept getting all these downloads of all this amazing information that the spirit of tobacco was telling me. And I go, oh, my God, that's amazing. Because when I used to do dieters, I used to fast. I used to have no food for three days. I used to connect to the plant. So quite often the shamans there, they'll put you on particular plants because they know that plant, or they know the power of all the different plants and what they're good for in terms of healing. You take this plant or you take that plant or there's a plant called Bogansana, which is a, a beautiful plant which actually comes out at night. The flowers come out at night. And it's a plant that the hummingbirds love. So at night, if you go, go out and you see the plant flowering, all the hummingbirds come out, which are really amazing little bird, right? They've got one of the fastest wings in the world, you know, the way they fling their wings, right? But Bogansana is a really powerful plant for your heart. So you've got issues around um, not being emotional and opening your heart, which is probably most Australians, then Bogansana will be really good for you. So they know the particular uh, plants which are really good for you based on your energy to help you connect to that part of your soul that you're blocking. So quite often, some people would go there but most people probably go there for like two weeks and, and probably do about six ceremonies right, every two days, right? Some people go there for a month and they do more detailed healing because they've got deep stuff going on. But like I saw a lady on fibromyalgia. Now, I don't know if people know what fibromyalgia is, but it's a very intense uh, symptoms where this lady couldn't even move. After four weeks, that lady walked out of that centre with no fibromyalgia. Mind blowing. Did that change her life? My God, it did. But did she have to go through a lot of healing? Absolutely. She had a lot. See, because people label things. You know, Western medicine said you got fibromyalgia. That's just a label. No, she actually had deep shit with her mother, which was was causing it. So Western medicine tends to label things so they can give you a particular drug. But as I said at the start, all illnesses are caused by limiting thoughts. Absolutely, because I can tell you, I've, healed pe I've helped people heal from over 50 countries with all sorts of ailments, and I can tell you it all comes back to limiting thoughts and limiting beliefs, and once you clear them and understand them, then your flow of energy comes through your body and you don't have any symptoms. See, there's no such thing as just a physical symptom. It's a bit like, you know, we're like mental illness, you know. Ayahuasca is great for mental illness, right, as well, right? And, but, you know, a lot of Western medicine says that mental illness has caused a chemical imbalance in the brain, which is not correct. That's one of the symptoms, but it's not the cause. And that's why a lot of people who take um, um, psycho drugs, they're never healing. It's actually making them worse. It's blocking them. But with ayahuasca, you can actually heal anything. But that's not to say that ayahuasca is the only thing that can. There are a lot of ways to heal. But if you've got a calling to ayahuasca, that's what actually what you're getting uh, called to do. Okay. Now, in other ways, in preparing for ceremony,
is you know the clear the cleaner your energy is when you go to drink ayahuasca the better so that means that you know most places over there they'll suggest things to eat and if you go on to uh, websites in peru then they can they'll tell you what diet you need to go on and they'll generally say go off sugar go off coffee go off a lot of spices you cannot be taking uh, pork pork and ayahuasca don't get on so you definitely can't be having pork you generally go off meat salt sugars coffee and the clearer you do that the clearer your body is uh the the more powerful the ceremony is going to be that's not to say you can't drink ayahuasca if you're still taking those things but the thing is the first ceremony ayahuasca is going to kick your ass and you're going to vomit a lot which is okay a lot of people tend to vomit in the first ceremony anyway vomiting is quite normal on ayahuasca but you, the, the main thing is about being ready is you've got to be ready to heal that means that there's something in your life that you want to change you've got some symptom and you know that you you're not dealing with yourself and you need some help with it and i was going to help you look at look at it as to what you need to see to heal that's the main thing you've got to be ready to heal because people take all they you know they go on diets and everything but they don't surrender the medicine nothing happens and if you don't if you don't surrender the medicine i can tell you it's very uncomfortable it's very painful right it's like ayahuasca trying to kick your ass and you're resisting it it's actually really painful if you resist ayahuasca And the question is, what, what, what are you going to experience on ayahuasca? Well, the thing is, you've got to be open to what ayahuasca gives you. Because in a way, ayahuasca is a bit like going on a blind date. You never know what you're going to get. Because like, you can have an amazing ceremony, and the next ceremony, it really, kicks you, it really kicks your butt, right? It brings up something you need to look at. So the best thing with ayahuasca is you can go there with intention, to clear something but to surrender to how wasp is going to help you look at it uh, some question there are western doctors and research starting to wake up uh, sort of but there's still a lot of um nonsense out there you know with all this covid nonsense that's going on right because there is no covid virus that's all a scam so you know there is a lot of doctors and research out there that isn't waking up yet i think we're more woke up than we used to be but a lot more people, like in Melbourne, from where I am, a lot more pe people are starting to realise is what's really going on with this lockdown? Why are we being locked down? It seems ridiculous. When you've got a 0.01% chance of dying, even if you believe the virus existed. So in terms of you should going over to Ayahuasca Centre, these are things I would look at. I would certainly go to a centre that you actually are recommended. Because I can tell you, when I was there, some of the shamans you can't trust. And I'm especially talking about women here. Because the shamans there suddenly get into their power and they've got all these West, beautiful Western women coming to drink medicine, is some of the shamans were actually abusing women during ceremonies. And even where I was working, they had to sacrifice shamans. Because I'd be seeing in the ceremony, I could feel some weird things going on. So I definitely would not go just go roll up in the ketos or in over there and drink and drink the medicine by yourself with that shaman. I wouldn't do that. So find out a place where you really trust the shaman. You know someone who's drank with that shaman. That's what I would do. Make sure that the place you go to has got good quality ayahuasca, that, you know, you've heard people have drunk the medicine there, and it's a strong medicine, and it can help you. Thirdly, make sure that you get, the place gives you support. In other words, it supports you before ceremony. Um, like, you know, when the place I work, people would roll up one day and would do the ceremony the next night. So there's a day that people could sit around and ask questions and talk to us, help them get connected to the jungle. So make sure there's support there before, during ceremonies, and after ceremonies. You know, like they have meetings to help you talk about what your ceremony was about. And of course, in this uh, self-preparation, that's that's really important.
Okay, so let me just talk about some of the other plants. So let me talk about it for another 10 minutes and then we'll have some question times. Oh, and someone just said San Pedro. Now, ayahuasca is actually called the mother plant. It's actually, it's actually in, in, in South America, it's called the main healing plant. That's why it's called the mother plant. And it really helps you connect to your feminine energy, to your emotions. And ayahuasca is drunk at night. It's a really inner journey. Now, San Pedro is actually a cactus. And it's actually grown, it's not grown in the jungle, it's grown in the mountains. Like in Peru, it's, it's, um, it's grown up near Cusco, up near where um, Machu Picchu is, right? So that's where you tend to take San Pedro. Now, San Pedro, you actually drink during the day. And what San Pedro does is, it actually connects you to nature. And it's an amazing, amazing experience. And for a lot of people, they have a more powerful connection to San Pedro than they do to ayahuasca. Especially people who are earthly, you know, like they're very earthly connected. They've got the earthly energy, right? Like music and they really love nature and stuff, right? Quite often San Pedro does that. Because when you take San Pedro, it's a bit like you look at nature in awe, like, you know, I could look at grass. It's like I could see it turning to the sun. You, like you sit there and just look at a plant for an hour or so because you're just so um, stimulated by this particular plant. Now, on San Pedro, you can talk to people. Well, those that said on ayahuasca, you can't. With San Pedro, you can actually talk to people. But I'd be wary because what a lot of people do is they end up just talking to people all the time and they're not actually allowing the plant to heal. So even when I took San Pedro, and you can drink it and people talk for a little minute, and take it, it takes about, same time, about 20 minutes to come on, is I used to, I used to spend most of the time by myself. Because I just wanted to connect to the plant. But again, San Pedro makes you very sensitive to nature, but you can you do tend to drink it during the day. And just connects you in a different way. To me, San Pedro connects you more to earth. Uh, ayahuasca connects you more to your soul. You are different. Now there's other plants you can take, like coca, which of course is what cocaine's made from. But coca over there is very powerful. And it's not like cocaine, because cocaine's got a lot of uh, crap in it, right? Which makes it toxic. But coca, you know, people quite often take coca leaves because um, it helps you with um, altitude sickness. So like you fly from Lima up to Cusco, where most people go to Cusco to go to Machu Picchu, the, the, it's about an hour flight, but it goes so high up, a lot of people get altitude sickness. So what a lot of people do is they, they, they um, chew on coca leaves on the plane. People go over, uh, people over there quite openly eat coca, right? And actually it gives you visual centers. I used to do my own coca ceremonies, right? Because I'm a visual person. By taking coca, it really opens you up to see your visual. Now the other thing that lady talked about was cambo, right? Which is like frog medicine. This is quite common for people to take over there as well. Right? I think Lisa talked about this, right? What they do over there, I don't know how Lisa's taken it, but she can make a comment in a moment. But what they do is they tend to burn a hole in your skin, right? And they tend to do it with a little, you know, those smoking things, what you call them. And they, and, and yeah, they just burn a little hole in your skin. So then they, what they do is they, they, the cambo is like frog, med frog medicine because frogs are really have a very strong immune system, right? That's why they can survive in anything, right? Is And they, they don't kill the frogs. They just scrape it off their skin. And then they put it underneath... Right, where they burned it, so it gets into your system very quickly. So not like the other plants, uh, it actually it actually has a very quick impact, very quick. It only lasts about 20 minutes to 30 minutes, but it's extremely intense. So what we used to do is when we did it with people in Peru, we'd get them to go and sit on the toilet straight away. What you do is you sweat like buggery because your body's trying to eliminate it because it's so strong, and you feel really hot. You tend to cough and you can shit a lot as well. But you, I remember I just sweat like anything and you feel really uncomfortable, like it's really intense. But then it come, you start to come down after about 20 minutes and then you go and have a cold shower to wash all the sweat off. And I can tell you that was, I felt so amazing after that. It was really, really cool. Now the shamans there say that if you do that three times in a month, your immune system is extremely powerful for the rest of your life. That's what they suggest. Do it three times in a month. 
But as I said, a lot of the hunters there, the shamans, they used to, to take cambo when they used to go hunting because they, 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 it, it was a way of them protecting themselves when they go out into the jungle. Lisa, do you want to make any comments on, on cambo? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I was fortunate to be trained through the IAKP uh, to be a gambo practitioner. And um, yeah, so the way you explained it is correct. So a very superficial burn is made on the yeah. topest layer of the skin. That's yeah. usually done with an incense stick. Incense, very yeah, yeah. Process. So um, there's never any blood. It's just the top layer of the skin. The frog secretion is then applied to this point or these gates are what they called. Yeah. Um, and the process, as you've explained, starts very quickly. So the medicine enters the body through the lymphatic system. And what it does is it clears the entire lymphatic system through the bile ducts, through the liver, into the small intestine. This is a very uncomfortable process. Um, you know, our uh, uh, um, lymphatic systems are so clogged up. Um, but the other beauty about it is it's also it's a beautiful preparation for ayahuasca because uh, it really clears the system of any toxins you were not able to detox during a dieta and it really prepares you for the plant medicine. So that's why they work very well together. Um, yeah, it's an extremely powerful process and I treat a lot of people where they experience great healing in terms of releasing emotional blockages as well um, through the use of Cambo. So it's not to be underestimated as a medicine on its own, but yeah, it does work really beautiful with ayahuasca. In a way, the way I look at it, Lisa, it's like a it's like a natural vaccination, right? And it is extremely powerful. Is it, but it's, it's a, as Lisa said, it's really really uncomfortable for, for about twenty minutes, but um, afterwards you feel amazing. You feel so clean, and that's why she said it's a good idea. And that's why a lot of the healing centres over there they 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 might give you cambo before we actually go on ayahuasca just to help you clean clean your system. Okay, so let's open up any questions. Just put your hand up if you've got a question that you'd like to ask. Tom, you got a question? Hi. I think um, I think someone else might have mentioned it as well, but I, I think what I like to try and understand, especially if you have some sort of uh, perhaps mental affliction that's been on for many years, is and you become quite desensitised to emotions within life, so you are a bit of a drifter, and whatever you do, I've, you mentioned it before about someone not experiencing joy. I'm just wondering the kind of uh, how how easy is it to be able to surrender um, when you've been for so long in a kind of almost so much in your head that you can't bring yourself down, if you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Because I noticed uh, it's interesting I asked that because I said that one of the questions from Alan Lim is about um, what about surrender is. Yes, because a lot of people don't under, uh, understand what surrender is. And surrender means is it's not giving your power away because sometimes people think, oh, you've got, you've got to surrender, not like in a war, right, when you're giving your power away. Surrender means that you're actually allowing the healing process to happen. So to answer your question, yeah, a lot of people are in their heads. And I've got to help them get out of their heads into their hearts. Because in, in, in Western life, you know, we're taught at school you've got to think a lot. Now, if anyone's read Eckhart Tolle, you know, The Power of Now, it's about not thinking at all. It's just about being intuitive. You know, I did a, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago on intuition. It's not about thinking, it's about just knowing and it's about connecting to the world. So like when you're surrendering, it's like whatever happens, you go with it, you feel it. And that's what Eckhart Tolle talks about as well. You know, he talks a lot about observing it, you know, because we actually, we're not our thoughts and we're not our emotions. Their experiences happen through us, they don't happen to us. So the important thing is, hopefully if I answer your question, Tom, and Alan's at the same time is, when the experience comes up, and this is what you should be doing in life, when experience comes up and you go, I'm feeling really sad right now, I go, oh, hello, sadness. I'm feeling you. Why are you here? It's a symptom. It's going to teach me something. That's what surrender means. You sit with it. You don't resist it. Because the opposite to surrender is to resist. And I can tell you that most people resist. And people resist in a lot of ways. Like addictions is a big, is a big way of resisting. Because rather than feeling, people take an addiction as an emotional tranquilizer which can be food, it can be gambling, it can be sex, 
uh, whatever it is, right? Shopping. Like in Australia, it's about being busy. Being busy is, a, is, a, is an addiction. And quite often people are busy because they don't want to look at themselves. And that's when they, while they're locked down, right, which is what they're really doing anyway to themselves, they go, what? How can I, how can I be by myself? Do you know what I mean? And, you know, it's about surrendering to the moment and allowing whatever's happening is okay. Because it's coming up for a reason to help you let go of something. If you resist it, in other words, you don't allow yourself to experience it, to feel it, then you're not going to allow yourself to go through it. And you think you're going to be okay, but you're not. Because if you don't surrender and don't heal it, it's still in your body, which can which is going to be very toxic. Because as an example, there's a lot of angry people. And I can tell because I can feel their energy, but they try and hide it. Because like in Australia, I don't know if about UK and Scotland, but, you know, we're told, don't be angry. No, allow your anger to come out. It doesn't mean you're going to hit people, but deal with your own emotions because no one makes you feel anything. They don't. All your emotions come from your choice of how you relate to an experience. So the important thing is you've got to sit with it. Oh, I'm angry right now. Okay, cool. It's okay. Why is that anger teaching me? Right? Anger is a very powerful emotion to help you understand that you want to change something. That's why you're angry. No one makes you angry. You're actually angry with yourself because you, there's something that you need to do, that you want to do, but you're not doing yet. Now, other people can trigger those emotions, but they don't create them. So the important thing is, yeah, it's learning how to get out of your head into your heart. And you can do preparations for this, like before you take plants, by like doing heart meditations. Learning to surrender by meditating, to allow yourself to experience and go, oh yeah, I'm feeling sad right now. Allow yourself to sit, sit in that sadness and go, yeah, hello sadness, why are you here? What are you going to teach me? Well, see, a lot of people are scared to go into emotions because they think they're going to drown in them. They think they can't get out of them. Now, when I train my healers, I train people through what's called the emotional tone scale, which is used a lot by actors, right? And it teaches you how to move up and down emotions. So I can train people to go from shame, which is right down the bottom, close to death. I know that emotion really well because a lot of shame when I was a kid, right? Is, is I, take them, I can take them up from shame to joy in a couple of minutes. But see, a lot of people aren't trained, Tom, to learn how to play with their emotions. So when I go to South America, and Tatiana will say this, is that South Americans wear their emotions on their sleeve. They get angry, but then they let it go. You know what I mean? They'll hold on to it. It's like a stone to hold inside, and they'll, they'll be passively angry at you, right? But in, America, in South America, they just express their emotions. It's a bit weird when I started off, but I actually really like that. Because you always know exactly where they are, don't you, Tatiana? Yes, 100%. You know where people are at because they're expressing it. See, in Australia, you know, I call it the big Australian lie. I'm okay, mate. You know, that's a big Australian lie. I'm okay, mate, right? And you, know, you say, how are you going? You go, oh, I'm okay, mate. And you go, what, really? You can feel the shit in their bodies going on, right? Okay. Tom, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, okay. There's, I'll just answer a question here and then I'll come back to the group. How often do you do ayahuasca in your life? Do you need maintenance? A really, really good point. How long is a piece of string? It really depends on people. Yeah. Now, because I was working with ayahuasca at a healing centre, well, I did it quite a few times, right? That's only because I was working there and I used to drink it with the people. Some people, um, I would do it more than once, right? Because sometimes if people do it once, they go, oh, they had an awful experience, they don't do it again. It's actually um, to do it at least three times. For some people, three times is enough. It changes their life dramatically. For other people, they might have a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. They'll go over and do it for a week, and then they'll come back. Uh, and they, I know people that go to Peru uh, once for a week every year just to keep clearing their stuff. It depends on how much stuff you've got to really answer that question. You, you know, you can't say there's a definite amount of times, but definitely more than once. It depends on how much you surrender. So I want to get back to this point about surrender. I watched this guy, because as I said, most people used to turn up 
and they sit with us for a day and they ask all these questions because their mind, they've got all this fear going on, right? Which is a bit understandable because you're about to do something that you heard a lot of stuff about you don't really know much about, right? And this, there's this Afro-American guy, he's probably about 20, and he's sitting there reading comic books. Everyone else is asking all these questions. And I said, um, do you have any questions? I was, he said, no, it's all cool. And he wasn't resisting. He was just totally surrendered. In the first ceremony, he just had the most amazing ceremony because he just totally surrendered. He said, oh, yeah, some stuff come up with my brother and whatever, right? But he actually just shared and allowed it to come up. And he just had the most amazing experience. It was just a really good example for everyone else in that group how to surrender. So he, his, his monkey mind wasn't ticking over going, having to ask all these questions, which is about control. What they really ask those questions is to try and control. No, to surrender means medicine, here I am. I'm trusting the shaman, I'm trusting this group, and I'm just going to allow this medicine to work through me to bring up the stuff that I need to look at, irrespective of how uncomfortable it is. Because I remember one lady, she said in the circle meeting, she said to the shaman, that was a really uncomfortable experience last night. And the shaman said, this is about healing. Whether you enjoy it or not is irrelevant. <laughs> It's about how much it helps you heal. Yeah? Because sometimes the more uncomfortable it is, it means you're going deep into stuff. So if shamans see you crying during a ceremony, they get excited. Not because they're masochists, because they know something's coming up to release. They're more worried if you're sitting there um, no, um, with nothing going on. Because some people sit in the ceremony and they're smoking tobacco. And they go... I don't know how anyone could smoke tobacco during the ceremony because you're not present. It means you're too earthly. You're not in your soul. You know what I mean? You tend to go off, but some people sit there smoking tobacco during ceremonies. Go, what? Shamans do it for another reason. They're doing it because they're connecting tobacco to bring in the energy of tobacco during ceremonies. That's why they're doing it. It's a different reason. See, they, and you know, one of the shamans said, tobacco is actually should be uh, drank not smoked, it's a lot more powerful, you actually drink it. But of course in the West it's all about um, helping people get addicted so they can make a lot of money out of you. Okay, any questions, any more questions? Hello. Hello, who's that, uh, Linda? Linda, yes. Yeah, what, what would you like to say, Linda? Yeah, uh, yeah, I have two questions. First is, um, uh, for, for this experience, do you have to take kind of medicine or it can happen through meditation? Uh, for example, I've been uh, doing the, uh, the, the dynamic uh, meditation of the Osho. So it also really a lot of emotions and the energy inside, inside itself. It's all, all, it's also about surrender and yeah, to connect to this energy and... Okay, so Linda, what I, what I said before is there's a lot of different ways to heal, mm -hmm. right? So do you have to take these medicines? No, because to me there's a lot of different ways you can heal, right? And sometimes meditation is a very powerful way to, for people to heal because it's all about connecting to what limited thoughts you've got and letting them go. And if you do that through meditation or you do it through yoga right, or you do it through um, playing music, right, however you connect to it, you know, drawing art, right, there's a lot of different ways you can actually connect to issues going on for you and letting them go and connecting to your soul. These medicines are one way of doing it, but it's definitely not the only way. Does that answer your question? Yes. So, um, so this can be, um, um, like a, a meditation so it's the, this experience in, is a cleansing it helps you to um activate your body energy and then to um it's a more about cleansing or it's about the energy receiving it's about all of those because what it does is ayahuasca it, it really makes you extremely sensitive and that's why like as i said that's why ayahuasca is drunk at night how does that? Oh, sorry. How does that? Ayahuasca. Uh, ayahuasca. Uh, A Y. 
A H U A S C A. So that's the name of the plant. Yeah, that's the name of the plant. Oh, Oscar. Okay. Yeah. And it's actually really interesting because actually that word means the vine of death. <laughs> and and it because actually it is a vine. You know, with the place I was going, there's ayahuasca everywhere. And it is actually is a vine. But it's really interesting because I like to play with words. And when you look at the vine of death, it's like die vine. Divine, mm. right? Because in a way it is a death. It's about this is how we answer your question, Linda. It's about death is about letting go of the old you <laughs> so you can connect to the real you. So in a way it is a death. That's the way they look at it. It's a death of um, of, all, of that fake you that you tried to um, be to survive in the world, which is what most people are doing, putting on their false masks. It's about letting go of those, allowing that, that old role that you've defined yourself to reconnect to who you really are. So in a way, that's a death. That's why I call, they call it the vine of death. Yeah. So someone, does that answer your question, Linda? Yes. In a way, when you're on the medicine, in a way, yeah, it opens up your senses in your body. You really feel aware of your body. As I said to you, like when you're listening to the music, I could feel it pulsating through my body. I'm not just listening to the music. I'm feeling it. It's a really amazing energy experience, right? So I'm really aware of my body, but I'm also very aware of the different aspects of, of my energy, my soul. So if you want to call that meditation, whatever, but you go into different states of consciousness, which a lot of people don't normally go into because they're in a very limited um, headspace, which is what Tom said before, right? And there's a very limited consciousness. So what, what ayahuasca does is it expands you to connect to a whole different lots of vibrations from is different dimensions. Kind of, yeah, it, it reminds me of the movie Lucy. Is it kind, kind of like that? I haven't seen the movie Lucy, so I can't comment. Yeah, and uh, so also it's like um, it's a less thought. So because in during meditation, the, the things uh, block you from being is your thoughts. So yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, and then through this um, the medicine, so it it happens like you you reduce you don't have much thoughts, and then you have more feeling. Uh, no, because when you're on the medicine, thoughts do come up. Because as I said, it, it, quite often what the medicine does is it brings up your thoughts you've been having. A bit like Tom said, you know, a lot of people in their heads. And it, so what the medicine does, it'll bring up what you're thinking and what you're feeling. But it'll sometimes mm -hmm. bring up your feelings that you're not totally aware of because you're in your head. But it'll bring up the emotions you hold inside of you that haven't released yet, like grief mm -hmm. or sadness or shame or that you've, that you've had from a child that you haven't let go of. So what it does, it, it connects to all the thoughts and emotions that are in your energy, but are not, you might not be conscious of. So it brings them all up into your conscious awareness during the ceremony. So you can have thoughts, but then once you go through the thoughts, you can just be in a state of amazing vibration, which is what people, some people get to, which is like being in a very deep meditative state. So you can actually reach that state. So, because everyone's experience is different, it's a bit like that's why it's a bit hard to normalize an experience, right? Because everyone goes through something totally different. But people do have thoughts, they do have emotions, because they're coming up to help you release. Mm -hmm. And when you get into that state of total peace or, bla or, or being blessed, just totally being a soul, right? Then, yeah, that that's meditative state. You can uh, experience that on ayahuasca, but you can also experience it without taking ayahuasca. Yeah. Yeah, that's your question. Cool. Yeah. Also, my question another is about shaman. So, is uh, to be a shaman like you born as a, uh, to be chosen to be like that, uh, and or you be trained as a shaman? Okay, it's a bit of both actually. Most people in South America, they're sort of born into families. Their dads have been a shamans and the grandfathers have been shamans, so they just assume their role as a shaman right but you actually do a lot of training to be a shaman mm -hmm. and it usually takes years of training because they do a lot of diets with different plants and as you said some of those diets can be 60 90 days 150 days mm -hmm. 150 days type of year so a lot of the shamans there they've drunk medicine from a, a long time 
and they've drunk a lot of different plants and that's why they're very very aware of a lot of different um plants and their healing abilities one of the shamans one of the shaman one of the shamans i i drank with he was 96 years old and I said, how long have you been drinking ayahuasca for? He said, 88 years. <laughs> Since he was eight years old. And I can tell you, this guy had more energy than a 20-year-old. And because they do it, as a tad, tad young, I'm sure, they do a lot of things during a ceremony. They're singing songs and they're connecting people, right? And this guy is in really high energy. But my God, could I feel the strength of that medicine coming through him? Because like it was in his blood. That's why I, w I wouldn't drink with a, a non-Indigenous shaman. I wouldn't. Because even when I was over there, I drank with a few American shamans who have been trained. Mm. But none of them were anything like a, an Indigenous shaman. Because like when I was in, uh, as I said, Tatiana, I first drank in Colombia. And so I just wanted to know when I first um, felt right to drink it. And I was at a backpacker's place and I just met this and I, I met this local Colombian lady, and she was traveling with a boyfriend on a motorbike. And I said, oh, where are you going tomorrow? And they said, oh, we're going to drink ayahuasca. I thought, okay. But they, she said, look, I've heard good reports about him, but we're going to go and meet him. So I went with them and met the shaman. And he had this big um, uh, Indian teepee, right? That's where, he, mm -hmm. that's where he did it. And we met him. He was, a, he was a lovely man, and his wife was a shaman as well. And they've been doing it for so many years. And we and when we were with him and met him, we just trusted him. Was, he had such a beautiful energy. So we did uh, three ceremonies with him. We stayed with him for seven days, and he he was an amazing shaman. And we just we actually drank it and then laid in the hammocks right afterwards while he played his music. It was amazing. Okay, Linda, you got another question? Um, I think oh, we'll be okay. So. So is it, is it the shaman the many things they do, or they do other ceremonies as well? Like, uh... oh, they do they do ceremonies with a lot of different plants, but they can specialise. Quite often, you have an ayahuasca shaman. Mm. Yeah, and but other ones they specialise in San Pedro. Other, 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 other shamans specialise in in tobacco. They just do tobacco ceremonies. So, so you can spe do... you can specialise, yeah. but most wet. But most Western people who go to South America, they're interested in drinking ayahuasca. That's why they, ayahuasca centers are grown up. So therefore, a lot of shamans have become ayahuasca shamans. But they can specialize in different things. But most of them, most of them you know, they've, they've drunk all the plants, so it just depends on what they choose. Mm -hmm. so I do energy healing, and I can do healing of all different types and kinds, right? But I specialize in people who have low self-worth who want to become healers. That's what my that's what I help, that's how I help people, because that was my journey, and that's my passion is to help people who've got low self worth become healers, and train them. So mm -hmm. I train people to become energetic shamans. That's what I do. Okay, so so what I mean is, uh, do they, uh, like uh, doing like uh, in my knowledge, shaman is like uh, using psychi power. Is that use the a certain process and. They're, they're bringing through the they're bringing through the um <coughs> they're bringing through the power of the spirits or the plants through their music and mm -hmm. through people drinking the medicine that's what they're doing alan's asking do you have a recommendation of who or where to drink okay now of course it depends i where i work was called the hummingbird center right which is a really good center right i don't know now what it's like because that was quite a few years ago and the charm might have changed or the owners might change. Um, I think you really need to know people who have been there recently and what the centre's like. But the Hummingbird is a place I would try to start off with. Okay, looking through the, um, looking through the uh, chat room here to see if there's any other questions. I think we've, we've covered the most. Tatiana, have you got any questions? No, I just want to say um, thank you because it's been very interesting you, uh, to hear your experience and um, listen to your stories. So oh. thank you so much for putting up this um, um, webinar or Zoom meeting because oh. it's been very interesting. In my experience, I have had also, I have been to some ayahuasca ceremonies 
and I feel that um, that has had a massive impact in my life in terms of clearing up lots of things and, and healing. So, yeah. Cool. Very yes. powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Is that. Where do you live, Tatiana? I live in Adelaide. Oh, really? Interesting. I'm from Adelaide originally. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, but I, but I live in Melbourne now because Mel Melbourne's probably the most open place for healing in Australia. Well, I lived in Melbourne for four years. Oh, really? Yeah. And I went back to Colombia and then I came to live here. But really? I really like it here. It's a very um, relaxing place. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of Colombians in Melbourne, as you know. There are a lot of Colombians come to a Melbourne. A lot in South America. They, they come to learn uh, English, a friend of English. Yeah, that yeah. Is correct. anybody else want to share any experiences they've had with any of the medicines? Can I just ask a, a quick question? Yeah. Um, uh, just, um, is there a connection uh, between uh, maybe psilocybin uh, and ayahuasca in the sense of maybe is psilocybin a good thing perhaps to do uh, in advance of it? Uh, and what the similarities in terms of... Uh, what did you yeah. say then? The center, what did you call it? Uh, psilocybin. I've no, I have like, no take. You know, from, you know from, from the mushrooms. Oh, mushrooms. Yeah, not necessarily. Uh, I, I've, I've had people who have taken other psychedelics and then taken ayahuasca, and others who have done none and taken ayahuasca, and it doesn't really matter. It all depends on whether you're willing to surrender to the medicine. Can Some, I just say something, Paul? Yeah, just one minute, Tadia. Sometimes um, people have, some have taken psychedelics, they're more open because they know that they can go into different vibrations. Right, okay. But not necessarily. So I don't think you have to take it beforehand. No, not necessarily. Tatiana, did you have something to say? Oh, yes, uh, on that, um, what I was talking about, about the magic mushrooms of psilocybin and the relationship with ayahuasca. In my personal experience, I find that they can be similar because um, some of the visuals that we have when we are in ayahuasca and the connectedness of being one with absolutely everything in nature is a very similar experience in my, in my, own, yeah. in my own view. So it can be similar and both of them share that they are, um, can be very spiritual cool. in terms of the experiences that we have. Cool. Thanks for that. There you go. I can feel, Tom, that you're getting ready to drink it. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I've just ended up in this position. Like, I never thought that I'd ever be doing anything like this when I, like, a few years ago when I was younger. But I just ended up, you know, leading everything. I think, I think when you spend so long within your head and you and you're trying to, you read all these different books, especially with Western. When you go to a Western um, psychologist and you you sit down in front of them and you know they're not going to answer your questions or understand you, you yeah. sort of reach the point in your life where you think this 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 isn't working, and that's when everything kind of hit me and I thought, well, I'm I'm you know I need to explore this whole new avenue, which has just opened up a, a, like a whole new <laughs> dimension of uh, of, uh, of thought in that. So so actually. Um, uh, I think, yes, I suppose that will happen at some point. So uh, I just like to, especially on the surrender, like we spoke about as well, it's very, very um, uh, interesting and good to know about that because I'm, I'm someone that holds on so tightly that needs to sort of, you know, cut himself away. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things underneath that. You know, a lot of people control because all control is based on fear. So it just means you've got some fears to let go of. So I'll certainly suggest people who are in their heads a lot if they go and drink ayahuasca when they're in their heads, they're probably not going to surrender. Because drinking ayahuasca is not a head medicine. It's not. It wants you to experience. It wants you to feel. And it wants you to feel your experiences and open yourself up. So certainly for someone who's in their head a lot, they probably need to open up first. In other words, allow yourself to feel and allow yourself not to try and control. See, because a lot of people try and control by turning over thoughts all the time. Most people have the same thoughts they've done for the last 10 years. In a way, it's being psychotic because you're turning over the same thoughts every day. It's allowing yourself to feel and not think at all. Be present. The less you think during a ceremony, the better. It's allowing yourself to be. Isn't that true, Tatiana? When you're taking your magic mushrooms or your ayahuasca, it's allowing yourself to be present. 
be there and allow yourself to experience it and not even think because when you're thinking you're trying to label something this is happening no just allow yourself to experience it because there's one experience I had with ayahuasca when I, I felt like nothingness. I can't even explain it to you. It was like an experience. I can't, I can't even label it to you, right? But it's like I felt a nothingness. It was amazing. It was just like I was nothing. I couldn't feel my body. couldn't do anything. I was just being. Now, I can't really put words on it or label it, but that's the best way I can try and explain it to you. It's like it was just a feeling. So I really think for you, people in their heads, they really need to get out of their heads because being in your heads is a very dangerous place to go, right? Because a lot of the media, they, they give you all this false information to control you. So being in your head is a very dangerous place to be because all of the thoughts you have are not true. Okay, anybody else want to say anything? Okay, someone said, do you have any recommendations but where you don't have to, don't have to travel overseas? I know there are some places in Melbourne you can drink ayahuasca. I'm not aware of them because I've never drank in Melbourne. But if you ask the universe to bring someone into your space to tell you where to drink it, it will come to you. Be open to it and someone will come and tell you. There are places I'm not aware of any in Melbourne, but I know some people do. I haven't necessarily heard good reports from some people because they're not really shamans, they're more facilitators. But if you can't travel overseas because of, you know, you've got problems with young kids or whatever, right, then create the, put out the intention of bringing an amazing shamanic person into your space that's going to run a ceremony for you, wherever you are. Do that by intention. Right, is that your question? Uh, is that Alan? Yeah. Uh, is there any sad, sad effects of the medicine? Sad effect? Yeah. Um, it, the medicine might bring up any m emotions for you that you might experience. And for instance, like the day after a medicine, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to heal it totally, whatever it's bringing up for you to reconnect to, that you're going to heal it during the ceremony. And that's why it's important the next day. You might be sitting in particular emotions. It might bring up sadness. It might bring up grief. And you might need to sit in the next day because you need to heal it. Because obviously one important thing is, right, if you go and drink ayahuasca and you're sitting with a lot of uh, healing people, it feels an amazing experience, right? And you can, you can shift because you feel safe and comfortable. But the important thing is, and the shamans will say this, uh, that's only 80% of the healing. They said 20% is when you go back into your life. It's about can you hold that vibration in your life? Because really that's why you're healing, so that you're, you're a changed person in your life totally. That's the important thing. So in answer to your question, Linda, it can bring up various emotions of all different kinds to help you heal. So, so what's the difference of the essential oil? Like, well, when, when I study this essential oil, it also told it's the spirit of the plant. Yeah. Absolutely. Like all plants, like essential oils are really based on plants of the same thing. And it's just about how you connect to them. So like in Australia, we've got a lot of powerful healing plants like eucalyptus. Mm. I actually know eucalyptus every morning because I love it, right? Yeah. And, I, and I connect to the, but it's about connecting to the vibration of it. And what essential oils is another way of, of using powerful um, energy of plants. But the important thing is how you use those. If you're using them as a magic pill that you rub the essential oils and say, this is, I'm going to heal, well, it's not going to heal you. It's about it's opening up to vibration. So if you use, utilize the plants to open you up to connect to what you need to let go of, those limiting beliefs that you've got from trauma, if you let go of those, by connecting to a particular vibration which the plants help you, then it's going to help you heal. But like in Australia, eucalyptus, euthanasia, is a, amazing plants to mm. use. Yeah. There's, a lot of, there's, a greater, there's a lot of bush plant bush plants in Australia that you can use for healing. Because in a way, if you're born in a particular country, there's a good chance that the plants around you are the appropriate plants for you. So like if you're living in England, like the oak tree is a very powerful plant tree. Yeah. I don't know about Scotland. What's very powerful in Scotland, Tom? Well, do you know what I discovered? Stinging nettle is a bloody powerful plant, and, I, and it grows everywhere. 
There you go. So your, your body, your, your, your actual body wants, really wants to connect to it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's everybody, funny. everybody, have a look at his energy now. They just talked about it. Now, this is the crazy thing because you know, I spent years, you know, uh, getting dead ends with, with uh, you know, doctors or or GPs and stuff, and and I've I always thought to myself, well, why? How can a plant do anything? You know, like how how can something, you know, how can like you know like a tea or whatever do anything? But then I was. I was shocked when I when I took the um this the stinging nettle which literally goes everywhere. I was like, this is the one thing that's helped me over anything else, you know, and 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 lots of other things that 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 um that I've noticed as well. So I'm discovering all these uh, wonderful things. I'm I'm getting a lot of help uh, with a um a friend of mine, a, a Dr. Drew. I don't know if you heard of him, but he's actually the one that um uh, sent me the link to your to, for today. Oh, cool. um, he he lives in Peru and uh, he does a lot of ceremonies himself. Um, but he's introduced me to so many natural um, uh, oils and you know and uh, all different oils that that like pumpkin seed and things like that. And it's just amazing how how much help it actually does does provide. Because it's quite interesting, Tom. I had the opposite to you. To you, <clears throat> is I always said, well, how can Western doctors help you? <laughs> and a lot of cases they can't. The more I learn about healing. I realise, because let's put it this way, if you go to a Western doctor, how do they diagnose you? And very often they can't tell what's going on for you. But see, I can mm. connect someone to energy and I can diagnose them accurately every time straight away by just like reading their energy. And that's what shamans can do. Because they know how to read your energy and your energy tells you everything about you. Now, if you're really connecting to a plant and allowing, surrendering to that plant's energy to come into you, you're allowing that vibration to work through you to help you clear something. That's why I'm making you feel good. That's why I don't go to Western doctors. I've been to Western doctors for 25 years, right? I wouldn't go to one. Because well, I don't heal you. This is the thing, because, you know, I've noticed that they never actually ask you about you or how you feel or anything and and you know yeah. uh it's only when someone asks you or tells you about yourself that you start to you know realize but i i think i was saying to dr drew that i realize now that in this that in this kind of western culture this is actually insanity and uh, we're living in in we're not we're living in a in, in a dreamland if that's if that's yeah. how we think that we're going to, we should live which is ridiculous yeah. um you know Absolutely. and it doesn't yeah and even that's even when people come out with talking about vaccination, if you understand Western, understand healing, it, it, the whole thing is ridiculous. You know what I mean? A vaccination yeah. can't do anything. It's just a way of controlling you and putting something uh, into into your body. So once you, you know, once I learned about healing, and you know, I've really connected to my past lives because I've been a, I've been an indigenous shaman in many lives. So that when I've really connected to to my experiences in past lives in this life. And when I when I went and lived with these shamans, my, I can tell you these shamans have never read any books. But I can tell you they know everything about healing. And they've learned it from the plants. Because it opens them up to a particular vibration. I mean it's just the most amazing experience to being with them. And there's a good there's a good way you can actually go. I meant to say this, right? There's, a, there's, not, there's a powerful way you can go and experience this in Peru. What a lot of the healing sealers centers do they have what's called work work experience, which what it means is you go and work there for a month. You pay like a thousand dollars, right, US or something, right? And what you can do is you do four hours work a day, which is like cleaning or whatever, and they allow you to shut on all the ceremonies. And it's really powerful because then you actually meet the shamans and you can be there with them when they're when they're cooking the, the plants and you get to know them. And the work is really easy. That's what a lot of people do. They go over and they pay $1,000, right? Spend a month there. And they do all the ayahuasca ceremonies for free. And they just do about three to four hours of work, of work a day, which is really simple. Nothing difficult. That's a good way to do it. Look up work, look up work experience in some of the healing centers in South America. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I started there. The, the, the way I started is um, they actually had a voluntary exchange. So I just went there and worked there for nothing. Right, I did four hours work. That's how I started off with. But the second day I was there, the shaman did his back in. So the owner asked me to help him heal, and I did a couple of healing sessions on him. And after two sessions, he could touch the ground. Oh. So the owner asked me, "Do I want to work there mm -hmm. as a healer?" 
right? So then I there was a healer. So then that, I just created that. The shaman, the shaman did his backing after two days. So it gave me a chance to show off my abilities. That's good to hear. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you guys for, for uh, all coming. Um, if you've got any other further questions, you can ask me through the meetup group. I've also got a group on Facebook. Which is a public group, which I do post there all the time on different aspects of healing and stuff. So that's a good um, one to join and, and just get regular postings from me. And that's all free. It's a free group. So about the the volunteer, like you said about the America, is that some website to you uh, if you go to if you go to particular websites for different just put up um ayahuasca center in peru or ayahuasca center in colombia and they'll all come up oh. and just go to particular ones and you'll see them just mm. do a bit of a search um on uh, on google just mm. for ayahuasca retreat ayahuasca healing retreat or something right and they'll come up for you and all of them, they'll see when you go through their website, they'll all show work exchange and they can, it's also good to look at diets. They'll show you what you need to eat and not eat before you go there. They want to make sure that you're healthy before you go there. So that's a good thing about to find out about all the foods to eat and not to eat, what they suggest. But okay, I think we might leave it there. Thanks for all, all you guys coming. I hope I hope you've all learned something out of it tonight and best wishes with your uh, experiences with ayahuasca in the future. <laughs> it, you know, it's a very powerful medicine. I saw it help a lot of people, heal from a lot of different things. And I think I'm just going to finish off with, when I actually drank ayahuasca, I was actually fascinated where it came from. And I was outside and I was holding onto the vine, right? And I was talking to ayahuasca and I said, ayahuasca, where are you from? And the ayahuasca said to me, I'm a son from a different galaxy. And I said to you, why did you come here as a plant? And I said, because... It's an easy way for people to actually absorb me. So anyway, I asked the shaman the next morning. I didn't tell him what I picked up. And I said, where's ayahuasca from? And straight away, he said, it's a sun. <laughs> so he knew that. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's nuts. Isn't that's that nuts? Cool. So it's actually the sun from another galaxy. That's why it's such powerful. You know, <laughs> generally, you know, like Teddy Allen talked about magic mushrooms. But I can tell you, from most of the people that come there, it blows their mind where they can go with ayahuasca compared to what the other psychedelics do. Not to say that you can't have great experiences with magic mushrooms, but I know from people doing ayahuasca, especially if you do it a few times and you, you know, you open up because you get more comfortable with it, is they go to an amazing places in the universe and and in themselves, which is a lot different from being in your head, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay guys thanks a lot and uh hopefully you, if you look at my talk we'll um come up with some other exciting talks from my shaman playgroup in the future enjoy your new year's eve and let's hope that 2021 is going to be a great year for you thank, thank you thank you guys thank you so much bye 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 thank you